Hello, I'm Robert Royal, and this is a podcast of The Catholic Thing. The Catholic Thing is a daily column series, 365 days a year, and you can subscribe to it for free by going to www.thecatholicthing.org, and every morning at 6.02, you will receive in your email inbox a short thousand-word commentary on what's going on in the church and the world from a Catholic standpoint. So I encourage you to to, um, subscribe. It's free, again, I want to say, and I think you'll be very glad that you did. Now, in uh, this episode of our Catholic Thing podcast, we're very happy to have with us Jade Hendrick, who um, is a man of parts. He's been involved in many things. In fact, he's been involved in so many things. I'm going to read you just a little bit of his biography because he's a man who has been both involved inside the church and outside in some important endeavors. Um, He was the executive director of government relations at the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, a very important post. He has a a licensure in theology and systematic theology from the Dominican House of Studies. And he's now the president of the Catholic Laity and Clergy for Renewal, which runs a substack that is called What We Need Now. It's quite an important substack. And that's another publication that I would encourage you to uh, subscribe to. Um, Jade, we are very, very happy to have you with us today. we're, we're going to be over in Rome soon, and then you're going to be coming over later in the month for this uh, synod that's coming up. And when I read your essay at What We Need Now called The Sins of the Synod, I said to myself, I've got to get Jade on a podcast with us because there are lots of people out there who are suspicious about what's going on in this synod. It was supposed to be one session last October. We're now having a second session, and then they're actually even going to be various study groups that are going to continue the study till at least June of next year, 2025. And so, look, look, just to to start out with just some broad general reflections, what did you mean to convey to readers by that that attractive title, The Sins of the Synodality? Yeah, well, well, first, Bob, thank you for having me. I'm a big fan of the Catholic thing. It's one of those things that I go to every day, and I'm just always impressed how every day you're able to get a new essay out, and uh, I always find it very enriching. So thank you for your, for your work. Yeah, uh, the sins of the synod. Um, uh, the, the whole essay kind of came to me as a response to a document that the general secretary for the synod and the diocese of Rome and then the general synod of bishops came out. So it had three letterheads on it. So it was authoritative, but it's outlined uh, an activity that they're going to do October 1st, is what they describe as the penitential celebration, to opening up the the synod. And the idea, I think, is a good one. It's always good to kind of reflect on, on, on sins and go to even go to confession to allow your, 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 your soul to open up to, to the spirit. Uh, but what this document does, um, a couple of things, but, but one of which is it outlines seven sins that are going to be confessed publicly. And the sins, uh, in my article, there's a link to the document, but, but among the sins, we have a sin against peace, sin against creation, uh, sin against abuse. Uh, the two that I kind of note in my essay, sin of using doctrine as stones to be hurled, and a sin against synodality. Um, and so the title of the essay just came from that. What, what are the sins that, that the, the synod leadership thinks kind of are important as they go into the synod? But of course, there was a second meaning to, to the title. And, and that kind of was more pointed towards just the, the character of some of these documents. Um, I, you know, the, the, the Holy See, unfortunately, you know, while it's doing, trying to do a number of very good things, sometimes the way it presents it is oftentimes in a very, in, in almost a, I, I hate to say it, but a silly way. And and so the second meaning of my title was kind of how this document and, and, and even the event itself, because there are some problems with, with what they're planning on doing, but, but there's just a way about the way that they go about things that are just unhelpful for the work of the church. And so that's sort of the second meaning of what I mean by that title. It's just, they're not serving the church well by just the way they're going about things. 
Yeah, I have to say, I, I suppose I ought to confess, since we're supposed to be confessing our sins, that when I first, when I saw that letter, I thought it was a spoof, actually, that it was a hoax, because it seems like they're going to be confessing for the sins of the church in the whole world, which I know you say in the essay is a little bit odd theologically to be to be doing. Um, and a, a sin against synodality, it seems to me, would be not being open to other points of view, because the whole point of synodality is we're supposed to be walking together. And yet it seems like if you look at that list, it's kind of a list of progressive concerns. It's not, you know, they're they're worried about casting stones of doctrine against people, but they aren't worried about people who are ignoring or disputing or denying doctrine. So it's all slanted in in a certain direction, uh, obviously. Let me ask you a bit more about that because you, I mean, you are sort of unique in that you've been on the inside of the church and you've interacted with bishops at the U.S. Conference uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops and other uh, prelates in the church, but you've also been kind of out in the world facing the U.S. government and, and the, the, the role that you played with the Bishops' Conference. How does a document like this get produced? I mean, we, we talked about, let me just mention again two of the points that you, um, two of the sins that you mentioned, the sin of using doctrine as stones to be hurled, when at least for those of us in the first world, it seems like doctrine is being ignored by large swaths of the Catholic population on abortion, LGBT, other thing. And is a lack of listening, communion, and participation. Now, as I say, it seems to me like there, one side of the, the church is being listened to, but uh, I think people like you and I are probably not as listened to there. So the transparency, the walking together doesn't seem to be symmetrical. That certainly seems to be the case. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't take any pleasure in writing essays like this. Uh, I, I really don't. Um, sometimes I'll run them by my wife and she, there you go again. Uh, but, but these things need to be said because this voice is not being invited seemingly into the official meetings. Um, and I'm, I'm sure it, I'm sure it's reflected at some level, but you ask how a document like this is produced. Well, all I can say, when I was at the USCCB, there was level after level of vetting, and ultimately it was document, documents were documents of the bishops. And I, I, you try to serve them faithfully in terms of reflecting their mind, but here, this is what's so kind of discouraging for me, at least, is that a document like this could actually see the light of day. I could see this as a first draft for some, some staffer coming along and kind of reflecting their own instincts on things. But that, this would never, ever see the light of day at the USCCB. And I'm grateful for that because it, it, the leadership at the, at, the, at the conference seems to be a little bit different than the leadership at the Vatican. And, and, it's, and it's not so much, I mean, it's, it's substance that concerns me, but it's also the style. And it's just done in a way that, it's hard to take it seriously. As you said, you just thought it was a parody and the same thing I, I wrote in my essay when I first read it, I, I was certain it was a parody. And then I went to the URL and it was a Vatican URL. So it's 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 frustrating, uh, but I think it's all the more important for voices like you, Bob, and others to um to, to make sure if 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 it's not being kind of aired in these official documents, at least those who are going into the meetings will know that there's another voice that needs to be re- represented. Yeah. I mean, read read another passage from your essay. Um, And I want to encourage, again, um, people who are watching or listening to this conversation to to go to uh, What We Need Now. I love that title because it really focuses in on almost on a daily basis. What are we we confronted with? And and we ought to confront ourselves with things that are going on in the church and and outside the church. Here's a passage that I I was taken with, an observation of yours. A recurring theme that comes from this Vatican is the implication that church teaching is not in itself pastoral, as if the truth is not for the good of the human person. Uh, there does seem to be a kind of a split here, and we've lots of us have noticed this over the last decade or so, that on the one hand, there seems to be this pastoral outreach, which is fine. You meet people where they are. But it almost falls over into a kind of a sentimentality that you know, people are are in, they're embroiled in their sins. They're trying to maybe they're trying to get out of it, but there doesn't seem to be a lot of urgency about that side of things, which is after all what salvation, but revelation and salvation are about moving us out of where we are into something else. Um, is this 
<laughs> is this something you've encountered elsewhere, this, this sort of um, repeated uh, assertion of a contradiction between the pastoral and the doctrinal? It's certainly the impression that I've been getting for years. It's, 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 not, it's not a conclusion that, like I said before, that I'm happy about, but it's certainly the impression that you get from documents coming out of the Holy See over the last few years. And, and it's unfortunate because we know that truth, as Benedict, Pope Benedict was so clear about and John Paul II before him, truth is what leads us to our fulfillment. But truth is not always easy. And the church is calling us to be saints. And calling us to be saints means calling us to conversion. And calling us to conversion means calling us out of our sinful inclinations. And you just don't hear that sort of language, or at least those concepts, in much of what's at least surrounding the synod. And it's about accompanying, it's about listening. And, and those, those things in themselves are, are very good. But accompanying, walking with somebody to where? listening to them for what purpose those in themselves don't have intrinsic value they have in value in terms of the the teleology the, the end of of where they're going and you don't have a sense of that the, the accompaniment is about accompanying a person both my the person listening and the person being listened to to conversion and to the gospel or 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 you know it's important to relate to folks but you we, we relate to them with the idea that we want what's truly good for them. What's good for them to love is to draw them out of our own sinful. And, 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 I, and I'm speaking to myself here too. I'm not trying to say that all these people out there, but for myself too, it's, it's are, are my conversations leading to someplace good? Is my relationship with somebody leading to someplace good? Because in and of itself, you know, I can be sitting next to somebody and watching the football game and it's fine, but it's not, it's not perfecting me. Uh, it might be building friendship at some level, but 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 I'd like to see more of these documents have a sense of okay, where is this all going? All right, I'm going to ask you an impossible question now, but I ask myself this as well. I think we both agree that that walking together is not necessarily a bad idea if it's truly walking together, and as we said, for the, ultimately we want we want ourselves and everyone. Um, to end up in heaven. That is the real purpose of the, the church and the world and God's revelation to us. With your experience of church bureaucracies and, and how they operate, and a lot of this, I, I think, I, I wonder myself, how much of this is the internal synod democracy, uh, uh, the synod bureaucracy, and how much is actually the overall vision of the Holy Father? We know that he wants us to walk together, but whether this particular way of doing things is the way that he wants or not, I, I don't know. It seems to me that they've taken they've, they've taken all these hot button issues off the table and given them to these study groups. And so now what are people going to talk about in that room for an entire month almost? Six days a week. Yeah. Other than, you know, how, how do we, uh, the phrase that you, you used is, um, what is it? It's about the, a new way of being church, I think is a, the, the phrase that you picked up. And you say, what, what is this new way of being church? What ideally would that be? And what is it likely to be? I know it's, it's an impossible question to answer, but I'm just curious what you have to say. Oh, ideally what it is, I mean, we just go back to ever ancient, ever new, that, that renewing the source of Christ's life in the church today, um, being church today, but, but this, this idea of be, the word, the word being is what troubles me. I mean, I, I can understand a desire to communicate the church, the faith in a new way, uh, which, you know, we, we've been working on for decades now, but there's always a need to do that better. But being suggests to me something a little bit more radical. And, and uh, you know, it's a, uh, admittedly disconcerting. We've heard a lot about this notion of census fidelium, the sense of the faith from the faithful, the sense of the faith from the faithful. And I'm afraid that this being new church is trying to redefine what that means. And to their credit, just a few years ago, the International Theological Commission outlined what census fidelium is, and I think it's seven or eight kind of characteristics and they're all about being faithful to the magisterium, to the scriptures, to pursuing holiness. But it seems that there's a movement away from that to, you know, here, here comes everybody, but here comes everybody in like in everybody's sense, whether you profess the faith or not. And that is going to be the new church. And, and you know, 
is that what they mean? I honestly don't know. In my essay, I, I, I raised that question and I said, this needs to be defined. And if it isn't defined, it needs to be taken out because it can be used in a very dangerous way. And the lack of clarity, we know that that's kind of a methodology sometimes that's used for, 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 for negative things, for dangerous things. But the lack of definition in some of these things, particularly this phrase, can be very dangerous. And it can, it can mean anything. It can mean some good things. But I suspect, as many others, including you, Bob, have said, you know, Trojan horse for, for who knows what. And so I would like to see it, if it's being used, be defined more clearly. But the sense of the faithful, sense of fidelium, that needs to be, uh, I, I would hope that um, theologians who are delegates to the synod will raise that, clarify what Newman meant about that, and put it in the proper context that, that like the International Theological Commission did so, so, so well. Hmm. Yeah, you're too young to remember this, I think, but I remember back in the 1970s when this idea of being church or we are church, and it's not the church anymore, it's we are being, and you're right to point toward this being. I mean, this really looks like the fundamental uh, nature of the existence of what the church is, at least in my mind, that's the danger uh -huh. ultimately that, that, uh, that comes up. Yeah. Listen, we're at the end of our time. We, we value brevity at the, at the Catholic thing. So, uh, Jade, thank you very much. Um, we're going to be both over in Rome in a few weeks, so maybe we can get you back to when we start to see you know, how things are shaping up then. Yeah. Um, I encourage you yet again to look for what we need now that Jade um, publishes periodically and to follow him and the work of his group um, and also to subscribe for the Catholic thing, which you, you should be already doing. But I'm going to uh, say once again, www.thecatholicthing.org and sit back and allow 365 days a year of the Catholic thing to just roll in effortlessly every morning uh, in your inbox. So thank you, Jade. Thank you all for listening or watching, and we'll see you next time.